morning, everybody. Hi again, my name is Danica, and I'm in the current Environmental Leadership Incubator Cohort for the 2022 and 2023 school year. Jen kindly invited me here today to share with you all what I've been learning throughout the project about eco-emotions. Learning about environmental studies can feel heavy, so I'm here today to acknowledge those heavy feelings and provide some management techniques that can be used to help you with any eco-emotions you may have. I took this course too my freshman year, and I know you will learn about the Anthropocene. This class brought up many emotions for me. Throughout my studies, I have struggled to process the reality of our environmental crisis. These feelings guided me to learn about eco-emotions and how I could better manage them. Today is meant to be an emotional toolkit for you to put in your back pocket as you continue to hear heavy environmental news. If you have your computers out today, there is no need. Go ahead and put them away. We're gonna start off class today with the chance for all of you to get to know each other a little bit better. So please take the next couple of minutes to discuss why you care about environmentalism with your neighbor. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for taking that opportunity to talk with some of your peers. Again, my name is Danica and I'm a third year environmental studies major. If you haven't heard of the Environmental Leadership Incubator Program yet, I'll refer to it as ELI throughout this. It's basically a one year long program that anybody can apply to. You don't ne necessarily have to be an environmental studies major. It counts for six upper division units. And once you apply, you spend one year pursuing any project related to any environmental concern. Some example projects from the past have included repurposing ballet point shoes, teaching fifth and sixth graders about sustainable nutrition, creating an eco-friendly surfboard repair resin. Students have really taken this opportunity in a million directions, so the sky is the limit in terms of creativity. The professor teaches you about grant applications and how to conduct informational interviews, and you're even matched with a mentor to help you throughout the year. If you have a passion project that you've been thinking about, this program is an amazing way to kickstart that and get some units. The biggest takeaway from Eli for me is realizing that anyone is capable of making a difference every single day. Eli has been an amazing learning experience for me, and I have nothing but good things to say about it. If any of you guys have any questions about it, you're more than welcome to come and talk to me. So kind of getting into what I did for my Eli project and why I'm here today, I started a club called Climate Convos last quarter. If any of you took ES40, then you probably heard about it and I may have gotten the chance to meet you. Thank you if you did come to any of my club meetings. The club is meant to be a space for environmentalists to come together and discuss the emotional difficulty of caring deeply about the planet in the 21st century. My first year at UCSB as an ES major was honestly really hard. I came into the major with a general understanding of the climate crisis, and I wanted to be a part of the change I thought was surely on the horizon. I felt optimistic and hopeful that I would leave undergrad with an understanding of how to solve this global issue. But my experience in college opened up my eyes to the severity of environmental degradation. Learning about how deeply rooted, unsustainable, and unjust practices are in Western culture was heartbreaking. This information was not only emotionally difficult to process, but it shattered my worldview that I used to have before college. This forced realization was difficult for me to accept, and I started to doubt if this path was for me because I wasn't sure if I could take the heavy news for the rest of my life. I started Climate Convos because I believe that environmentalists should have an emotional support system when coming to awareness of the state of our world. If any of the feelings I had sound somewhat familiar to what you're experiencing now, I hope that this can be a helpful discussion for you. Know that you're more than welcome to reach out to me at any time, and I'm more than happy to be a friend to each and every one of you. Today, I will be discussing eco-anxiety and eco-emotions. I will cover some methods that helped me cope that may or may not work for you. I will refer to my own emotions that may or may, may, or may not be relatable for you. However, I hope to get the point across that any feelings you have surrounding your passion for environmentalism are valid. 
and there are resources and communities available to help you process them so that you can keep pursuing the work that we all know is so important. Also, I want to say that I am not a professional on this topic. I just started learning about eco-emotions the start of winter quarter, so I'm here to share what has helped me the most. This is not all that there is, and I encourage you to learn more about this topic if this discussion feels meaningful to you. The information presented to you today heavily relies on the works of Good Grief Network, Joanna Macy, Chris Johnstone, and Sarah Jaquette Ray, who is the author of A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, the book that you read Chapter 3 from for homework. Before we start our conversation today, I wanted to say I know it's not very normal or comfortable to talk about feelings, but I invite you to enter today's class with an open heart and mind. I urge you to take a step outside of your comfort zone. This absolutely is for me. And if at any point of this discussion you feel the need to leave the room, you are welcome to. Please listen to yourselves. Ooh, sorry, that was the slide I wanted there. <laughs> We're going to start off today with a mindfulness video. Thank you guys so much for participating in that. So first I'm going to define eco-emotions today. Eco-emotions can be defined as any emotional reaction to the understanding of environmental degradation. Know that you can learn more about this topic under an umbrella of similar terms, the most popular being eco-anxiety. Eco-distress, eco-anger, eco-guilt, and eco-grief are more examples. Variations include an emotion with the prefix eco in front of it. The emotion listed is used to specify the most prominent emotion triggered by an understanding of our environmental crisis. Climate change and all other environmental problems are issues that every single person on the planet is processing. Our varying levels of privilege and power, such as the location we live in and our socioeconomic status, influence the way we frame and feel about these issues. For most of us in the U.S., we are experiencing eco-anxiety, the anticipation of what is to come. However, the daily lives of some have already been deeply impacted by environmental issues and the emotions triggered can present differently. Today, I hope to emphasize the following. Emotional awareness is incredibly important. Understanding of our own emotions and others can bring us closer together and make us stronger in a time of crisis. Not only is emotional awareness beneficial for your own well-being, but it enables you to better engage with environmental work. Number two, I hope that to get the point across that recognizing your emotions is the first step to being emotionally aware. If you have been feeling anything throughout your studies, I hope to teach you a handful of strategies that can be used to help you recognize and name those feelings. Recognition of our emotions is the first step to processing them and allowing them to transform. And lastly, I hope to normalize tough discussions. By standing up here and talking to you about ego emotions for this class, I hope to take the first step towards normalizing that learning about environmental studies is emotionally challenging. In doing so, I hope that those of you in this room who need to hear this feel a little bit more comfortable voicing your concerns to trusted companions and or learn new coping mechanisms and communities that can help. All feelings are valid, especially any feelings that arise from caring deeply about global issues. As environmentalists, and especially as ES majors, we are consistently learning about our world suffering of both human and non-human life. In this course, you will study consumerism, systemic racism, the climate crisis, water and food shortages, uneven distribution of wealth and opportunity, the sixth mass extinction. Processing one of these problems alone is overwhelming. The understanding that they are all intertwined can make this study far more emotionally challenging. This class focuses on the concept of the Anthropocene which is essentially a study of how deeply human influence has affected the natural world. For me, this brought up many questions. 
Are humans innately bad for the earth? Is there hope that we could change our ways to live more sustainably and just? Am I naive for even trying to find help? If change isn't possible, will a life spent doing environmental work be meaningless? How can I commit to work that forces me to see the world suffering? I acknowledge that these questions are heavy. I'd like us to take a break and please discuss with your friend if you have any questions that have come up during your studies of environmental issues. I know some of you are not environmental studies majors, but I ask these questions under the assumption that you are taking this GE because you are interested and familiar with environmental topics. If nothing comes to mind, please share your thoughts on some of the questions on the screen or even something you've learned about environmental issues that stuck with you or was difficult to hear or learn. You are also more than welcome to take this time to take a breath or reflect for a moment. Thank you all for listening and for your openness. All right. Thank you all for listening and for your openness to have such a vulnerable and real conversation. Sarah Jaquette Ray, the author you read for homework, cites Emily Green within that chapter, who is a licensed clinical psychologist. Emily Green made a distinction between her ego emotions compared to other emotions she has felt. She wrote that I found this topic brought up feelings that were unique and their ability to create a sense of intense, globalized anxiety on an existential rather than personal level. She describes how thinking about the reality of climate change activates what existential psychology would call our ultimate concerns or existential facts of life, including finitude, responsibility, suffering, meaninglessness, and death. Eco emotions are unique in the way that they focus our concerns far beyond ourselves. For example, eco grief could be grief of what has been lost or will be lost, including potential futures and countless lives. Eco anger could be anger towards those contributing to the problems or inflicting suffering. Other emotional responses to an understanding of environmental degradation could be frustration towards the unfairness of the predicament. Another could be pain for suffering and lost opportunity. Growing up in the 21st century poses many challenges. However, with a better understanding of how our world's problems affect us, we will be better equipped to problem solve. And as Sarah Jaquette Ray says, keep our cool on a warming planet. For a couple seconds, would you guys like to share with a partner what kind of emotions come up when you think about climate change and em environmental degradation? Thank you for like going along with all my prompts. I appreciate you being open to all of this. I'm going to briefly shift this conversation away from eco emotions to discuss how emotional awareness is beneficial for your own well-being and also environmental work. I'm going to touch on decolonization of the mind because it further explains how emotional awareness is important for creating a more compassionate and more just world. The textbook definition of decolonization of the mind is the process of freeing our way of thinking from the cultural or social effects of colonization. In other words, decolonization is the process of identifying and unlearning ideas, actions, and ways of being as our culture has normalized. The idea of decolonization is still new to me, and I'm working to wrap my head around how deeply the destruction, violence, and exclusivity of colonization continue to influence Western culture today. I'm not going to spend time discussing the heaviness of colonization. You heard about it in the podcast you listened to for homework, and you've heard about it throughout your classes. Instead, I want to focus on what this concept of decolonization of the mind can offer to you. Decolonization is not so much about the past of colonization, but more about understanding how it affects our present and future. 
Learning about the intersection of environmental and social justice was the first time I recognized how interwoven global problems are. This understanding at first made me feel like there would be no way to fix them all. I thought about how the exploitation of natural resources and people allowed for systems like capitalism to prosper. I couldn't imagine a solution that seemed to address all needs. I found it frustrating that every solution I could think of would seem to cause more problems. I could not imagine a sustainable future. Then I learned about decolonizing my mind. I had no idea my solution making was so deeply influenced by Western culture. Western culture is overly hierarchical, competitive, consumption-oriented, capitalistic, and imperialistic. These tendencies don't prioritize or value sustainability and social justice. Once I learned about decolonizing my mind, solutions finally hit me. I saw better ways of life, better ways to grow our food, better ways to create and use energy, better ways to define value and success. Better ways of being that are better because they are more sustainable, more kind, and more just. Other cultures and societies have richly and successfully explored these alternatives. By learning from them, we can find the answers we need to picture new possibilities. We need the imagination to translate these thoughts into our society and way of life. Decolonizing my mind gave me a glimmer of hope. So how do we transform our culture? How can we move forward and break free from the influence of colonization? I would like to offer the metaphor of Western culture as a wall. Decolonizing our minds is the act of peeking over the wall to new and better ways of being. How can we climb the wall to look over it? One step is acknowledging the limitations of our own perception due to our cultural biases. Another is open-mindedly learning from different cultures and beliefs. An entire course could be taught on decolonization, and I want to note that my distillation of it is a scratch on the surface of how many are thinking about this concept today. It is a difficult and lengthy process to be able to recognize all the ways our culture has influenced our ways of thinking. However, I hope that by introducing this concept, I have shown that one of the biggest ways you can help the environmental movement starts with yourself. Very real and very meaningful change can start with nothing but you and your mind. The mess we are currently in can be explained by a long history that has disconnected us from nature and the equal valuing of all life. Our path to solution making must be guided by a shift in culture, and that starts with individuals. Emotional awareness is the tool that can help us reconnect with the values we want for our world. I strongly urge you to return to this idea as you discuss some of the heaviest mistakes in human history throughout this class. The dominant culture of the Western world lives through us, and transforming our culture into one of inclusivity and equality will require open-mindedness, compassion, tolerance, and creativity. The rewriting of this future begins by understanding the limitations of our perceptions, and emotional awareness acts as the pen or the tool we could use in this rewriting. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on instances when you could have been more open-minded. I acknowledge this is a difficult task, but I hope we collectively can embrace this challenge. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so to kind of connect that back, I presented decolonization as an idea to prompt you to imagine a new world, one with a new value system. I ask you to think about how this would look in practice. I hope that this calling inspires an open-mindedness. We can't create a better future without a vision. I hope that by acknowledging the limitations of our own perception, we can begin to build this vision despite it being entirely new and unfamiliar. 
The concept of decolonization gave me an idea of how I could take action immediately in my life, empowering me. It answered some of my questions I presented earlier. Not all people are innately bad for the planet. A shift in culture can change our ways, and changing my mind is an action that feels very possible and meaningful to me. Decolonization gave me a solution I could believe in. Not that it would necessarily happen, but that it could work, which gave me some hope. Although this concept may not soothe your ego emotions the same way it did mine, I hope it shows you that valuable environmental action can happen anytime, anywhere, with nothing but you. I'm not saying this action is, is easy, but it is accessible. Decolonizing is an action that you can take with emotional awareness. Back to my takeaways for today's lecture. One of the three that I wanted to explain is the benefits of emotional awareness. Emotional awareness allows you to be a part of this wave of action that is essential to the environmental movement. To create a culture and way of being that aligns with our values, we need to be self-aware. Emotional awareness helps to build this, and it allows us to think and act more rationally and creatively, which is what we need to step into a new world. This lecture is about eco emotions, but before I gave you some methods to help manage and cope with these feelings, I wanted to explain that this action is beneficial for environmental work as well. By building emotional awareness to help yourself, you are simultaneously building a more compassionate, rational, and creative individual which is what we need in the face of this crisis. Building, building emotional awareness translates into every aspect of our lives. It has countless personal benefits, including enhanced emotional regulation, increased resilience, and enhanced mental health. Behind me is a longer list. For the rest of our time together, I'll go into some emotional management techniques that can help you build emotional awareness. Before we start, please discuss with a friend what you do to help with emotional management. Thank you guys for discussing with a friend again. For the rest of our time, I will be discussing different emotional management techniques. These techniques can be used to help you recognize your ego emotions and emotions in general, which is another one of the main takeaways I want you to get from this lecture. I will also discuss some that can be used to redirect attention and act more as co coping mechanisms to help process these difficult emotions. The first emotional management technique I want to present is a simple strategy you can add to your life that has been proven to reduce anxiety, improve academic performance, and improve sleep. We started off class today with a mindfulness video. Mindfulness is a type of meditation practice. Meditation is a tradition that has been around for centuries. In many faith traditions, something akin to this practice is in place. It's a powerful tool designed to train your mind to focus and redirect your thoughts. In a study published in the journal Psychiatry Research, study participants showed brain changes and reported they felt less stressed. So not only did meditation change the structures in the participants' brains, it also changed how they felt. Meditation has been proven to have significant health benefits beyond reducing stress. An extensive list is on the screen behind me. These benefits help overall mental health including the difficulty of processing ego emotions. If you are interested in implementing meditation into your own life, here are a couple ideas to get you started. The first is Mindfulness Club at UCSB. It's a fantastic resource and connects you with a community of peers. You can also just search mindfulness videos on YouTube, which is exactly what I did to prepare for this class. You could purchase a meditation guide I have one called The Blooming of a Lotus by Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Vietnamese monk. It's great. And then if none of these seem fitting or comfortable for you at this point in time, 
you can also create your own meditation practice. All you need is a quiet location with few distractions, a comfortable posture, an open attitude, letting distractions come and go naturally, a focus on breathing, and a focus of attention. Practicing on your, bro on your own is great, but I want to emphasize the value of doing so in community. Having a community to go through this practice will help you stay committed to it, and it can be enjoyable and more fruitful to be able to share and grow with peers as you work together to change your mind. On the topic of eco-anxiety and eco-emotions, creative expression acts as an outlet to release and transform your emotions. Creative expression can take many forms. It can be fun to try a handful of new forms of expression and see which one feels most comfortable and beneficial for you. Personally, I journal a lot, which has been a really nice way for me to express myself if I don't necessarily feel like sharing the thought with friends and family. I recently started painting too, which has been a lot of fun to try out. Here is a list of a couple, just to kind of get your head turning about new ways to creatively express yourself. But for the next couple of minutes, discuss with a friend a form of creative expression you're interested in implementing into your own life. Thank you guys for taking the time to discuss with a friend. The next emotional management technique we're going to talk about is gratitude. Gratitude is a technique that can be used to redirect your attention and manage your emotions. It is shown to have incredible mental health benefits. You can practice gratitude by starting your day off by writing just two or three things that you're grateful for. Gratitude can be very simple. For example, this morning I woke up and I thought, wow, I'm grateful I can hear the birds this morning. I'm grateful that I have food to eat this morning. I'm grateful I saw a cute dog walking down the street yesterday. Once you start to get the ball rolling, coming up with things you are grateful for can come quite naturally. The benefits of this practice may take time to feel, so don't feel discouraged if you don't instantly feel happier the first time you practice gratitude. In a discussion I had with Sarah Jaquette Ray, she said that in her moments of overwhelm, she asks herself, what else is true? This question came from her Buddhism teacher. By this, she meant that when she catches herself in a rabbit hole of negativity, caught in all the bad news, saying what else is true has helped redirect her thoughts to what is positive. Yes, climate change is happening. Yes, there is suffering. Yes, the news is bad. But what else is true? All of us are sitting in this room together and care about it. There are so many people working towards change. There is always something else that is true. Sometimes we just need a little reminder to break negative cycles of thought. I like to remind myself that negativity does nothing to help the movement. Reminders of what we are grateful for hold power to re-engage us. Jen asked me to provide an activity so you can all receive your lecture attendance today. So you guys can take out your phones and on Canvas look for Lecture Participation 2.4. And for the next couple of minutes, please create a list of some things that you are grateful for. The last emotional management technique that we are going to be talking about today is witnessing beauty. Witnessing beauty is another technique that can help redirect our attention. I want to start off with a quote by Aubrey Marcus. You are comprised of 84 minerals, 23 elements, and 8 gallons of water spread across 38 trillion cells. You have been built up from nothing by the space parts of the earth you have consumed according to a set of instructions hidden in a double helix and small enough to be carried by a sperm. 
you are recycled butterflies, plants, rocks, streams, firewood, and wolf fur, broken down into their smallest parts and rebuilt into our planet's most complex living thing. You are not living on Earth. You are Earth. Beauty can be found everywhere. It comes in many shapes and many sizes. It can make you feel big or small. You can find it at any time. It starts and ends every single day. And it is out all night long. It's in all our backyards. And beauty doesn't have to be the picture perfect moment you might typically think of. You can find it just looking up at the trees. It might even fly past you. Living each day, reminding yourself of the miracles of life, can be grounding and remind us of all the reasons why this work is worth caring about. I wanted to end talking about community. Having a community you feel comfortable with and supported by can help with the processing of difficult ego emotions. Humans were meant to be social creatures. We are meant to be in community. Some of our worst ideas of punishment is solitary confinement and banishment. American culture is highly individualized. I started off this presentation asking you to be brave today because discussing emotions is uncomfortable for many. This is a direct result of our di di divisive culture. In efforts to break this boundary, here are some ideas to help you start expanding your community. One could be confiding in a loved one. Another could be doing Good Grief Network's 10-step program. And the last could be joining my club. Sorry about this shameless self-promo right there, but um, Good Grief Network is a nonprofit, and they have a 10-step program to help you walk through eco emotions. It's definitely for heavier processing, so if this is something that's on your mind a lot, I really do suggest this program. It also connects you with a network of people around the world. And my club is having a meeting on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Jana Diamond is going to be speaking, and she is a UCSB alumni and somatic practitioner in private practice specializing in climate change emotions. She supports individuals and groups to build inner resources for collective evolution. It's going to be a highly interactive meeting centered around teaching us how we can call on the wisdom of our bodies to transform climate fear and overwhelm. In conclusion, building emotional awareness brings power to your life and is essential to what you can bring to the environmental movement. It allows us to help ourselves and others. Internal work allows us to show up and bring our best selves to every aspect of our lives. Sarah Ray states that our internal and external work should be synergistic, breathing life into each other. For you to contribute your best to environmental work, you must take care of yourself. Environmental studies and work is emotionally taxing, so our ability to care for and manage our emotional responses enables us to stay in the movement for the long haul. Today you heard of specific techniques scientifically proven to build your emotional awareness. This included meditation, creative expression, gratitude, 
witnessing beauty, and building community. Right now, I ask you to choose the technique that you had that had the most appeal to you. I ask you to practice it for one week and witness any changes it brings you. I hope today's discussion makes you more aware and more willing to speak out loud about your press about our pressing environmental problems. Your courage to have these discussions will allow us to better support ourselves and others as we reimagine a safer, kinder, more just, and more sustainable future. I'd like to end today with a quote. Hold on to what is good, even if it is a handful of earth. Hold on to what you believe, even if it is a tree that stands by itself. Hold on to what you must do, even if it is a long way from here. For the rest of class today, I want you to practice normalizing tough discussions and building community. I invite you to, to discuss what you have heard and your ideas about it with your classmates. Here are some additional questions to guide your discussions, should you feel drawn to any of them. Thank you all for your attention and engagement today. I appreciate you being open to a vulnerable and heart-led conversation. I'll be up here for the rest of class if any of you have any questions for me. If you want to talk about Eli, thanks.